Amen. So, Miss Daisy, we got to get you through the books of the Bible and then the, the sacraments and stuff, which you can, we should better coach you through. But how is it coming with the books of the Bible? I am sorry because I have to find my Bible. Okay. We'll get out one of the Bible songs here in a little bit and we'll do it with that. We'll just sing the song till it's in your head until you can't stand it anymore. Maybe we'll take a few breaks to talk about some of the books. Uh huh. Do we have to do concordance? What's that? Do you have to do concordance for the books of the Bible? Nope. There just should be the stuff in the append, or you know, there should be a listing of them: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. I'm, sometimes I skip over that one if I'm not careful. So Genesis, Eticus, Le Eticus. <laughs> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. End of the history books. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, um, Hosea, and it should be Amos and Obadiah, right? Am I looking right? Oh, Hosea, Joel, how could I forget Joel? Um, Joel, um, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. And there you go. Let's see what we got here. Okay. This is the checkers game Oops. where Grant's on. That's not what I wanted. 
Let's see here. New Testament books of the Bible song. Let's see what we got here. I think this is the one I showed you guys before, so what's the one we'll do again? Share screen. Here we go. New Testament. Okay, should we go through it again? Or do you want to try a different books of the Bible song? Can you give this one a try? All right, do you feel ready to say or sing any of them or should we go through the song again? Romans. Romans versus Corinthians. Um, Galatians. Or is it Ephesians? And Galatians? Galatians goes first. If you remember, um, I've said before, I don't know if it'll help you remember, but Galatians is probably one of the first ones written, so that's why. Yeah, that's all I got. There you go.
How about, um, so you'll see it, you're all the way through your memory work and so are you, Faith. Does either of you have any questions about anything right now? Just, will we give Faith a little more, or Daisy rather, a little more study time? Okay, let's see here. I'm gonna do a stop share for a second. I'm gonna see if maybe there's something else that we could take a couple minutes and, and watch. That's not what I meant to do. Let me see, I'm trying to find something here for all of us. you'll have all the men's names that also start with T. So the last of those place names are first and second Thessalonians with a T. Now you've got three letters to men, two men, three letters start with T. First and second Timothy and Titus. Boy, this is slow and pokey today. Well, let's see. Hopefully this wasn't written by some totally liberal guy, but we'll take a look. It's a little animated short here about the first Christians while we let Daisy keep studying. So share screen. Christianity, the early church. Hey, I have a whiteboard. This guy has a chalkboard and he grew his fish on there just like I had the fish last week. Okay, let's go. Okay, halt there. They claim that this just sort of happened. 
It is true that up until the time of Abraham, Abraham's um, ancestors worshipped many gods, and then God called him out to worship one god. And then while the, um, while the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, they probably did fall away, and, and over and over again during the time in the Old Testament, they fell away. But this is a very human-centered thing. It also usually goes along with the idea of evolution, that species evolved and then um, religions evolved and they evolved from having many gods to one god so inaccuracy right there um, and I think we all know this is just the Sunday school depiction of God he does until he became Jesus he did not actually have a body that like that Um, yeah, King James English there, kind of old. Now that is asking a lot from a guy, especially a 99-year-old geezer like Abram living in a time before general anesthesia. But those were the terms of the deal, and in exchange, God had chosen Abraham and his descendants to be a great nation. From this, we get the expression that the Jews are the chosen people. Thanks for keeping it clean, Thought Bubble. So some important things about this God. One, singularity. He, and I'm using the masculine pronoun because that's what Hebrew prayers use, does not want you to put any gods before. Okay. by Lehman, but good enough. Yep, you threw in Timothy twice, so let's go from Hebrews. You were pretty close.
very good. So yay, he got that done. Um, I'll write it down because I'll probably leave it to Pastor to do the stickers for me. Do you want to hear an Old Testament song first to start you out or not? Not sure. All right, let's see here. Um, Let's see here. Here's the Bible, books of the Bible. So we'll do it again. If you don't like it, we'll find another one. Yep. Just so long as you feel you'll be ready to do it next week. Do you want to hear the song again? Oh, uh, no. I just weird. Okay. So I will go back and do screen share on the other one. What was this? What the heck? Okay. Okay, you guys seeing the same guy in his purple shirt with the Star of David on the chalkboard? You seeing the guy with the chalk drawing of the Star of David on, on the chalkboard? Yeah. Okay. Because it was telling me something different on my computer before I shared, so, but showed this picture. His message of peace, love, and above all, justice across Judea during his actually average length life for his time. He was remarkably charismatic, attracting a small but incredibly loyal group of followers. And he was said to perform miracles, although it's worth noting that miracles weren't terribly uncommon at the time. Jesus' message was particularly resonant to the poor and downtrodden. Pretty radical. Yeah. All of which was kind of threatening, 
Hold on a second. I'm gonna pause it. You see what, there's that Jesus of Nazareth, and they're showing it in several languages. Well, they're at least, it looks like they're trying to maybe show it in, in Latin, and um, I think it's supposed to be the Aramaic right there, Jesus, Nazarenus, Rex, and then I can't tell if this is switching over to Hebrew or if that's supposed to be the Eudaios. I, I can't tell. Let me see if I enlarge it. Um, now it's covered up. Uh, no, it looks like that is. So they left off the, the last, the thing for the last I. Um, and they switched it over to something Hebrew. But anyway, we'll keep going here. Next part is going to talk about um, remembering it was the Romans that killed him because this is the root of some of what we call anti-Semitism or hating Jews is blaming them for killing Christ. On a bigger sense, all of our sins killed Christ and besides it was the Romans that nailed him to the cross and we don't go around Italian hating so. We are going to discuss it, though. Jesus' divinity, that means he was God, right? We have no questions or doubt about that among us, right? We all believe Jesus was God. Can I hear a yes from out there? Yeah, I was wondering if I could use a bathroom real quick up our back. Go ahead. How about faith in Yosia? Can I hear a yes? We agree Jesus is God? Yes. Yes. Yes, I agree. Very good. So this guy, he is not wanting to um, take the Christian role. He's just trying to explain knowledge-based things, but we say Jesus is, is divine. But we'll watch the rest of what he says here. Both called sons of God, both sent to free the earth from never ceasing. 
So to catch that, we've talked about that before. James, the brother or half-brother of Jesus, he's probably the one that wrote the book of James. And he's also, um, um, he was the head of the church in Jerusalem for a while. So when it talks about the James who is in charge of the church, like in Acts 15 or so, um, it's almost certain that that's James, the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of John, the disciple who was a fisherman, he was dead by then. He was the first of the, of the remaining 11 to, to be killed. Judas killed himself, and then James was killed in Acts. And the other James, there was another James who was one of the 12, who wasn't the brother of Jesus, but it doesn't seem that, that this is him. Um, that again, that historian from outside of the Bible said that the brother of Jesus was the one in charge in Jerusalem. Um, the other James are other stories and legends about what happened with his life, and they think he traveled with like, with um, the other disciple named Simon, who was not Simon Peter. So this that that's what he says here about James. I'll back it up just a smidge, um, and we'll hear about James again. And we talked about that last week. I wrote it out on the board for you. Ichthys or Ichthys as it says here. Um, you'll see this here in a second. The Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos. We have that up so far. There you go. Jesus Christos, the U, Theos, Soter. Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. I an open letter click the wrong thing. Finally available in my favorite format. In the first century, when it was still to kind of hide from the Romans. Ichthys, the Greek word for fish, was an acronym, and it was a super clever way to talk about religion without anyone knowing that you were talking about it. But you'll never guess what happened. Even in places where it's completely fine to talk about Christianity now and to use you know regular Christian symbols like the cross, you have had a huge resurgence thanks to these plastic automobile de I mean, seriously, Nick, this, I haven't seen a comeback like this since Jesus. Best wishes, John Green. And lastly, Christianity was born and flourished in an empire with a common language that allowed for its spread. And crucially, it was also an empire in decline. Like, even by the end of the first century CE, Rome was on its way down. And for the average person, and even for some elite, things weren't as good as they had been. In fact, they were getting worse so fast that you might have thought the end of the world was coming. And Roman religion offered no promise of an afterlife and a bunch of squabbling. So the whole thing about the promise of the afterlife, what the Greeks and Romans offered for an afterlife was kind of a shadowy underworld, like it says here, um, 
They did go to the underworld, but it wasn't a concept of salvation. If you were a super awesome hero, they might take you up to Olympus, like Hercules, who was half god anyway. But most people stayed in what was called Hades, which is not burning hell in the sense we talk about hell, but um, it was just a shadowy existence. And then some few people were tortured in Hades, like a guy named Tantalus. We get our word tantalized from it. He did something really rotten, and they put him in this pool of water where the gods did, where he would try and dip down to get a drink of water because he was just super thirsty, and the water would always dip as he dipped himself so he could never get to the water, even though it was right there. And they put a cluster of grapes up above him because he had eternal hunger, and when he would reach for the grapes, it'd always just go right out of his reach. And then there was another guy named Sisyphus. And if you ever feel like you repeat your, have to repeat your day over and over and over again every day, that is just extremely boring. Sisyphus had to spend his eternity rolling a rock up a hill, like a big boulder, and it would get almost there and it would roll back down again. So, but other than that, most of the spirits in the afterworld, they kind of had a hazy existence. They were, you know, almost like sleepwalking through eternity. Um... And so the Christians come along and say, you're going to be you, but you 2.0 or 10.0 or whatever you want to call it in the next life. Well, you'll be you and you'll get your body back, but somehow you'll be really perfect. And your the world around you in this new creation is going to be perfect. And that was a very radical concept. And for these people who are living in a hopeless situation, the promise of the afterlife was very important to them. So, not Christian, but cute animation, and it does tell us a thing or two. I had recently been looking into, um, I had recently been looking into, um, how Christianity took off, and this particular, this particular video was pretty similar to that. How you coming, Daisy? Do you need a little more time to study? Do you want to go through the song again? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see here. All right. I have so many tabs open at the bottom. It's just crazy. There we go. All right. There we go. Bad chair dancing. Joshua Judges Ruth First and Second Samuel First and Second 
There you go, that's the historic part, so you got through that. Okay, don't want to hear the song for a little while, then I take it, right? You don't? No song? Okay, so then we're going to do a share screen, and we're going to watch a little film about the Reformation done by the same animator. If he gets off t if he gets off and he's not fair to us Lutherans, of course I'm gonna have something to say. But here we go, a little little Reformation cartoon. Oops, I gotta I gotta pull that one up. All right. So you guys have the same guy pulled up from European history? Is that what you're seeing? The same guy from that other video? Okay. Today it's time to find out what else besides money was behind the competition between Spain and England as they fought it out on the seas and across the globe after 1550. That's right. Today we get to talk about religion. As you may know, the internet is terrible at engaging in nuanced and thoughtful conversations about religion. But if you think like our contemporary religious discourse is bad, just wait until you get a load of 16th century Europe. Okay, so over the centuries, the Catholic Church had developed a powerful structure under the papal monarchy. Its courts, religious laws, local priests, and a huge bureaucracy of religious officials enforced its domination. And Catholic ideas of the time backed up social and political inequality. For example, church teachings described monarchs and noble people as closer to God than ordinary people. It also had ideas about how the universe worked and sought to repress those whose ideas were different, as we'll discuss further when we turn our attention to the scientific revolution. But in general, Catholic domination of so many aspects of life produced so much resistance beginning in the early 16th century that European Christianity eventually split into two, and then split into like 17,000 competing subgroups. It all starts with Martin Luther, a bright young German man whose father wanted him to become a lawyer, as so many fathers do, so Martin Luther went to law school. But his real concern, even after getting his law degree, was salvation, so he became a devout monk. Still, though, he was agitated, worried about salvation generally, and specifically about church teachings that faith and good works were needed to achieve salvation. For Luther, doing good works seemed a bit like bribery, like wasn't full faith in God the important thing? This kind of thinking meant that Luther was on his way to heresy, that is, beliefs that went against the principles of the Catholic faith. And the heresy of, for instance, denying the Pope's authority could get you burned at the stake, as John Hughes was in 14. <coughs> now many of Luther's objections to church teachings were highly about, say, whether the word repent in the Bible
So in Catholic doctrine, there was a state after death called purgatory, a kind of holding place for souls that are not pure enough to ascend to heaven, but not bad enough to go to hell. Souls in purgatory can be purified by prayers from the living and also purified by tortuous afterlife punishment. And in 1517, the Pope issued a special indulgence to raise money to continue building the splendid St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Purchasing one of these indulgences was said to release a soul from purgatory. So if you had a deceased family member or friend whose sins might not have been totally cleansed through their faith. Sure. Sex, you could yes, ma'am. Um, so you know what I said? Do you want me to say it all over again when I have any part? Or can I just start where I stopped? And then start where you stopped. sound to you like a naked attempt to use people's worry and grief as a cash grab and Luther agreed like one monk who sold indulgences literally said quote don't you hear the voices of your dead parents and other relatives crying out have mercy on us for we suffer great punishment and pain from this you could release us with a few alms why do you treat us so cruelly and us to suffer in the flames when it only takes so little to save us. I'm not here to criticize any particular religion, but that is a smidge manipulative. It wasn't only Luther who took offense to this practice. Merchants and artisans also noted that it seemed a lot like blackmail. Many city dwellers objected to their hard-earned money going to support the aristocratic children of the wealthy who held high positions in the clergy and lived in luxury without ever having to, you know, earn money. Thanks, Talk Bubble. So for Luther, salvation wasn't something you bought, either by good works or by purchasing indulgences. Instead, he believed in salvation by faith alone, and so one should seek to fortify one's faith. In 1517, Luther, then in his early 30s, composed 95 theses expressing questions and differing opinions on these and many other theological issues, perhaps posting them to the door of the chapel of Wittenberg. But in whatever form, his ideas spread. Soon, papal documents and books of canon law were being burned by students during protests as earnest young Christian humanists vented their anger, and Luther's initial questioning of the church rapidly became rejection. For we claim the papacy not to be the holy church, Luther stated, nor any part of it, and we are unable to cooperate with it. This rejection... That was a wild-looking Luther-looking green, wasn't it? ...of the Catholic Church as it operated in the early 16th century came to be known as the Reformation. Luther began to take on the entire church establishment. In European Catholicism at the time, priests were the authority. They mm -hmm. read the Bible and then told you what it said. sinners and that the only true authority was the Bible. It was, he argued, the word of God that provided the relationship with God, not the word of priests. He believed that the hierarchy of priests and bishops and cardinals and the Pope was inherently corrupt and that such corrupt individuals could hardly serve as intermediaries with the divine. Sola Scriptura, only the Bible or scripture, was his motto alongside the keys to salvation. Sola gratia and sola fide, only grace and only faith. The idea of sola scriptura led to a wide-ranging revolution, especially by boosting reading and individual study, because suddenly it was important not just for scholars to learn to read, but for everyone, because the written word of God was the way to God. Now, at first, authorities didn't see cause for alarm, although early in 1521, the Pope did excommunicate Luther. Several months later, Luther was summoned before representatives of the Holy Roman Empire at the Diet of Worms, which is overwhelmingly the easiest history term to remember because they literally called it the Diet of Worms. Leading the assembly in the town of Worms, Germany, was the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Oh, did the globe open? I don't get it. It's just a can of mixed nuts. What does that have to do with the Diet of Worms? Oh, Stan! Very frightening. I have a diet. 
And he really did look like that. These people that ruled some countries in, in Europe, they intermarried a lot. And a lot of them that had this strange jutting jaw and this lip like this. Some of them couldn't even close their mouths properly and drooled some. It was the result of too much intermarrying. King of Burgundy, also the entire Habsburg Empire, Italy, all the Spanish possessions in the Western Hemisphere and Southeast Asia, which, I mean, if you've ever met or been a 19-year-old, you'll know is a lot of responsibility for someone who cannot legally drink wine in the United States. Although, on the other hand, he does look like he's 50 in this stained glass window of the Diet of Worms. Charles's rulership of the Holy Roman Empire was gained through the votes of electors who had selected him from other royal or noble contenders. Among those electors was the elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise, whom Charles had bribed for his vote. Frederick was religious, but not a fan of the papacy. And many aristocrats saw Charles as threatening world domination because, you know, he was dominating a lot of the world. So when called to account by such a massively powerful ruler, everyone expected that an insignificant monk like Martin Luther would completely fold and admit his errors. But he did not. I can do no other, he supposedly said. The 500th anniversary for this event passed just a few weeks ago, by the way. Um, the anniversary of Luther standing there and saying in front of this mighty emperor when they said, you need to retract your teachings, he said, here I stand, I can do no other. The Holy Roman Emperor then declared him an outlaw to be captured, but German princes took his side and Frederick the Wise hid and protected Luther. Why? Well, that remains one of the great unanswered questions of history. Maybe it was because Frederick was genuinely concerned about papal abuses. Maybe because Frederick felt that Luther couldn't get a fair trial. Maybe because he felt that Luther and the reform movements he was leading would limit Charles's power. Regardless, after Frederick's death, his brother and successor continued to protect Luther and his followers, helping in 1530 to organize the Schmalkaldic League of Protestant Princes to protect the Lutherans, which, I mean, as names go, is no diet of worms. On the other hand, if Marvel's looking for a new superhero franchise, how about the Schmalkaldic League of Protestant Princes? Early in the 1520s, Luther wrote tracts outlining his beliefs in greater detail. He also translated the New Testament of the Bible into German, that is, the local language or vernacular, instead of elite Latin. And thanks to the printing press, 200,000 copies were printed in the 1520s and early 1530s, and many more of his other writings went into print. The Reformation went from being local to being German to being a European-wide movement, in large part thanks to the printing press. Meanwhile, many German princes took up the Lutheran challenge to the Holy Roman Emperor. If Charles was against reform, many princes would be for it as a way of restraining the emperor's power. Luther summoned them to defend German values against the corruption found in Rome, and because of that, Luther is sometimes called the source or father of German nationalism. And then in 1525, peasants and other village folk across southern Germany began protesting, eventually including an estimate. This is a sad story, um, and it's one of those things you wonder if Luther really handled it right. This is called the Peasants' Revolt, and... If you listen up, this is how Luther decided to handle it. Leaves a lot of questions to this day. Means there's far fewer Lutherans than there might otherwise have been. He did 100,000 rioters who sacked castles as well as religious centers. The princes and nobility crushed them. They could get behind religious reform, but not mass social change. And Luther agreed, slamming the rioters in Against the Rioting Peasants, soon reprinted sensationalist title against the murderous thieving hordes of peasants. So, you know, Luther favored some reform, but not like equal rights for peasants reform. All the while, the reform movement spread, and as it did, it developed offspring. Already in 1519, Ulrich Zwingli, a Swiss priest, began preaching reform in Zurich, and he supported Luther's main criticisms of the papacy, but he disagreed on the Eucharist, or communion. Christian ritual in which worshippers eat bread and drink wine, or don't, depending on your perspective. Catholic doctrine held that through the miracle of transubstantiation, the bread and wine literally became the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Luther argued for something called consubstantiation. In which 
That's actually a slight error. People have said that's what we believe, but the actual true term that we Lutherans use is real presence, but pretty close in the ballpark. Which the bread and wine are still bread and wine, yet also the body and blood of Christ. And Zwingli believed that communion was only a symbolic ritual in which the bread and wine were just bread and wine. I know this will seem to many of you like an extremely obscure theological argument that cannot possibly have been important, but... But for those of us going through confirmation class where we just studied communion, I hope you see that it is an important point. Uh, somebody's um, trying to get through to me, I think. Oh, junk mail. Okay, we, junk text. Okay. It was. These theological questions were not just a matter of life and death. They were a matter of eternal life and death. Zwingli's preachings eventually turned some of his followers to a more radical interpretation of Christianity. These people were called Anabaptists, and they held that faith was a matter of individual thought and free will, so only a thinking adult could knowingly participate in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, so they argued that baptism, a cleansing ritual that had long been performed on infants, should only be available to adults who'd chosen to accept Jesus as Savior. And as reformers increased in number and variety, Luther did something else that was really shocking. In 1525, he got married, even though Catholic clergy were supposed to be celibate. Luther preached that God made two sexes to procreate and that the clergy's celibacy was against the divine plan. So he married Katerina von Bora, a literate young woman who'd been in a convent since the age of five. So if you're looking for a woman hero and you want to keep it in the faith, a lot of girls and young women like to read about Katerina von Bora. She was put away in a nunnery. Um, a convent by her stepmother when she was nine years old and um, Luther sprung a bunch of these nuns and she was not satisfied to marry anybody but him and that's not what he had in mind for himself but eventually he saw the wisdom of it and he grew to love her but here's more and this was controversial even among his supporters one of Luther's best friends and admirers lamented that by marrying Luther quote revels and compromises his good reputation precisely at a time when Germany stands in need of his spirit and authority. But Luther wrote a lot about marriage and sermonized about it too for the prince's nobility and his growing number of followers. One of these lectures refers to the story of Adam and Eve as written about in the book of Genesis in the Bible. Moreover, this designation, woman, carries with it a wonderful and pleasing description of marriage which, as the jurist says, the wife shines by reason of her husband's rays. Whatever the husband has, this the wife has and possesses in its entirety. The result is that the husband differs from the wife in no respect than in sex. This certainly wasn't equality as we now understand it, what with the wife shining by reason of her husband's rays, but the notion of equity of marital property was heresy piled on top of the heresy of clergy marriage. All of this led to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V deciding to put down the pesky Protestant princes of the Schmalkaldic League once and for all in 1546 and 1547, and he almost did so. He had vast resources at his disposal, including tough soldiers from the Spanish armies who defeated the League and captured some of the leading Protestant princes, and Catholicism appeared to be making a comeback. But then, in 1552, the League suddenly took to the field again roundly defeating the imperial forces. In 1555, the Peace of Augsburg decreed that whoever ruled would determine the religion of his territory. And so communities would be Catholic or Protestant based on the religion of their prince. Whew, we really dodged a religious war bullet. No, nope, no, the Reformation story was not over. Luther had called church corruption a horrid abomination and its defenders excrements and vermin. And those who now entered this titanic religious struggle in other parts of Europe would be just as vehement even if they were following different plots. The finer points of theology continued to divide people, as did the politics of religion and overseas empire. In short, more bloodshed was to follow. We'll take that up next time. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much for watching Crash Course here. Well, that was a thing. 
Any thoughts on that Reformation video? Do you need a little, a little more time, Daisy? Yeah, Amos. Oh, Amos. Malachi is the last one, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> Malachi. There you go. Very good. All right, so I'm going to go through it with you because I said you only have to do half at a time, but see if you can say the whole thing with me. I have my Bible closed. Someone else may have to fact check us if, <coughs> if I lead us astray. <coughs> so hopefully the, the transmission delay won't get to us too much. We'll try this together, right? I'll go slow because of transmission delay. Genesis. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, et, Chronicles, like the Chronicles of Narnia, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Whew. End of the history. Job. That's right. Psalms. Proverbs. Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon. Isaiah. Jeremiah. Lamentations. Ezekiel. Daniel. Joel. Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, yeah, Jonah, Micah, okay, let me see, what did we do here, all right, yeah, it should be, let me find this back where we, where we got off here, so, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, yes, I left them out there. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Yeah, maybe we should do it again because I missed up too. So, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Um, Son of Solomon, and then Isaiah, that's right, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. All right. How's everybody feel now? Good. Sorry, I accidentally glitched. I was um, basically just like kind of. Sorry. 
Very good. Thank you for coming back. I am going to type up something for you, Daisy, to um, for next week, what you're going to need to know. It's going to come as three messages. So, one, you have to bear with me as I type. Baptism. Okay, oh wait. One is sacrament. Okay, bah. The typing is always so slow on here. Okay, two, part two, um, baptism. The washing of, of, of rebirth. Physical element is water. Romans. Anybody else here remember what chapters we find baptism in? Romans chapter 6 and Titus chapter 3. So Romans chapter 6 is where you find the discussion of dying with Christ through baptism and rising again. Um, Titus chapter 3 is what calls it a washing of rebirth. Um, as, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, you need to know all three of those. Thanks for asking. Yeah, those are the three parts of, of what how we define a sacrament. Thank you so much. Lord's Supper. Um Jesus Body and blood in with and under the bread and wine called real presence physical elements bread and wine um, let me see here um, All right, here's the Lord's Supper. And then the last one's gonna be confession and absolution. And you don't have to do this word for word for me, but just be able to explain this. And if you wanna do a screenshot here in a minute, that's fine. Um, confession and absolution. Um, Okay, so those are the things. Do you need for me to scroll up or down so you can see it? Or well, you should. You can scroll up and down on your own screen, right? So you're muted, so I can't hear you. Okay. 
And so you'll see, uh, um, we're looking for our, for your um, essay. Have you got your essay done yet? Um, I haven't been able to work on it, but I think I'm gonna finish it today or tomorrow. Okay, I'm gonna give you my email. I sent it to Daisy, but you can take it down again. I could always send it to your mom too, if you need it. Do I, after I'm done, do I email it to you? Yes, so you can either type it in or rescan it, or if you've written it on a paper copy and you're not able to do either of those, well, your mom might be able to photograph it and send it to me. We can see if that works. Or but I could, like, take a picture of it. Yeah, um, and then I'll, 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 um, Okay. Yeah, so you can send it by text and then I can see about picking it up and emailing it to myself and printing it out. Um, we, Pastor and I want to take a little bit of time to look through it. Um, but yeah, include something about your original baptism to make it personal, whatever you think. Um, you probably both have interesting stories. I've seen Daisy's picture online. The cute little dress. My daughter had one when she was about that age. She was baptized, though. Autumn was baptized in the hospital because she was six weeks early. She's perfectly healthy, but we went ahead and did that. And I imagine you have some interesting stories of your baptism in Eritrea. Does anyone have pictures or some stories they can tell you? Or do you? Uh, I think. I think so. Okay. Are your godparents still over there, or are they here in the United States? No, they're still over there. They're still over there? Okay. So, yeah, if you have any interesting stories. Um, I don't really remember much, but I'm going to ask my mom. Ask your mom. That's what most of us do. Yeah. Some people have decided to put the date in there. Um, it helps you find out when your baptismal birthday is. And... Um, Daisy's mom always makes a big deal out of that, but not everyone does. Um, I found out when my baptismal birthday is, so I insist on another. Like I told you, you got to find those little religious holidays where you can find them, right? Um, I think March 25th. March 25th? Okay. But yeah, um, the baptism... So you can put that in there. Yeah. So we're not going to finish a lot early, but we are going to finish a little early. And what's real convenient is that you guys are already at home. You don't have to wait for a ride. Um, yay. So um, before we do that, the, the big thing, a couple of big things are outstanding. Is we And I let... Um, I let your mom know, Daisy, and you'll see us. Same thing with you. We've got to figure out when we're going to get your robes fitted. They don't have to be fit that well. We're not talking about going to a seamstress, but figuring out which of those confirmation robes fits you the best, making sure it's not all rumply. I'm getting a stole out for you, making sure the stole isn't all wrinkly. So we want to do some of those things. Um, either next Sunday when you're at church, if you want to go to the cabinet where confirmation robes are and start looking around, or, you know, like Sunday morning church. I don't know if you're going to come live or if because of Mother's Day, if you decide not to come live, let me know. And um, I'll just probably teach from home again. But yeah. Confirmation robes and confirmation. Any questions? Anybody else have anything else to add? All right. Well, you girls are getting close to the end here on this. Who wants to pray for the day? All right. Well, if no one else wants to pray, I guess I'll say the prayer. I'm kind of thinking we forgot to open with a prayer, but I think God was with us here anyway. I don't remember actually doing the prayer at the start. Okay, go ahead. Amen.
Amen. Thanks for praying. You all have, as, as oldsters say, you all have a blessed week. Bye. You too. Take care. Bye.